of us at some time have deceived someone else. We, we blurt off something hoping to compliment someone and in the whole time that we're doing it, we're haunted by the fact that that's really not the way we feel. We're probably lying through our teeth. Deceit. It's a rough thing. In this chapter, this is kind of an odd text. It's one that, that is not focused on a lot. In this chapter, an individual tries to deceive Jesus Christ. Let's pick up the story. It begins in verse 22, Matthew 15, Matthew 15, verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, him being Christ saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now watch this. But he answered her not a word. Let's stop right there. He, he being Christ, answered her not a word. Let me show you the deceit. A woman comes to Jesus in behalf of her daughter who has an unclean spirit. She's demon possessed. And here's where the deceit is. This particular woman was a Gentile. Now we would say right off the bat, what's that matter? Well, we'll get into that in a moment. She is a Gentile. She is a Syrophoenician, which indicated the area in which she resided. So she is not a Jew, she lived in an area where there were all kinds of Jews. And they kind of intermingled together. She comes to Jesus pleading her case. She's a mother. She has a daughter. A daughter that no doubt she loves. Because I'll be honest with you, what she's doing is risky. We'll find that out as we get farther into the text. She loved her daughter. She had had to watch. And I'm mad living a little bit. I know. She had had to watch her precious daughter when this demon would come upon her. Now, it didn't happen continually. The demons were wise enough to know that if they hit her continually, she would not physically be able to take the abuse. But when that demon came upon her, she would fall down into the floor. 
She would pitch and she would throw. Her legs and her arms wailing. I don't know how old the daughter was. It really doesn't matter. But I've got an idea that there were horrible, terrible things spewing from her mouth. And literally what I'm focusing on here is the language. I imagine that she cursed. I imagine that she said words over which she had no control whatsoever. It was this demon attacking her. And her poor mother had to watch this. And I've got an idea that she probably, and we know that when these demons come upon these people, they had tremendous strength. Remember the Gardenian maniac? They had tried to chain him, and he would just break these chains free. And I could see this mom trying to hold her daughter down, maybe with her hand in her mouth, trying to keep her from swallowing her tongue, trying to save her life. If she was like that madman from Gardera, if she got anything in her hand, she would probably hurt herself. It was something in her physical body that hated this demon possession so much. I imagine she got to the point, and I think that's what the Gardenia maniac did, she got to the point that she was actually trying to kill herself rather than go through that. This mother had heard about Jesus. By the way, this isn't the only time he did it with the Gardenia maniac. This isn't the only time that he had read someone of demon possession. Perhaps she had heard of a case. And she goes to Jesus. Now, here's where the deceit comes in. This woman, who was a Gentile, knew the prejudice that Jews had toward other races. Isn't prejudice a horrible thing? We just acknowledge Martin Luther King Day on Monday. Prejudice is a horrible thing. To harbor feelings against someone because of the color of their skin, because of their race, because of their nationality, whether it be African American or whether it be uh, Asian, whatever, Mexican, whatever, to harbor feelings of hate. It's a horrible thing. And I thought at one time we had made great strides in America. But I don't think we have. It's still there. Still. Particularly in the South. She knew that the Jewish people 
were full of prejudice about anyone who was Gentile. You see, we talked about African American, we talked about uh, Mexicans, we talked about Asians. Basically, every single one of those are Gentiles. And that's what we are. See, when it comes down to it, if you are not Jewish, you are Gentile. And she knew. You know, as I read that, and I love the Jewish people. I love them. And I support 100% that they are God's chosen people. I acknowledge that. I love Israel. For one reason, because the Bible tells me to. Tells me to love everyone. But another reason is the fact that God says clearly, if we will bless Israel, God will bless us. That may be an improper motive, but it's true. But with me, I've got a bigger reason. My Lord and my Savior was a Jew. I love the Jewish people. But, having said that, to me it is horrible that a religion and the Jews, they have their religion. To me, I think it's just horrible that a religion is known as being prejudiced. And they were. And you know what's really sad about it? Most mainline Jewish people today not all of them. Most mainline Jewish people today are still prejudiced toward Gentile people. Most Jews will not accept the fact that we have a right to worship the same God that they worship because we're not Jews. I thank God in heaven the Holy Spirit revealed to me a part of Jesus that they don't know. They're blind. Someday, someday their eyes will be open. They will realize what they did 2,000 years ago. Because you see, it really wasn't Rome as much that crucified Jesus. The Jews just had to go through Rome. Every bit of that was orchestrated by the Jewish religious authority. Someday they'll realize that. So she's aware of the prejudice that Jews have toward Gentiles. But she is a broken hearted mom. So she's willing to lay all of that aside. I'm going to come to Jesus. Now there's two or three things about her that we've kind of got Again, to ad lib, evidently the woman had the ability to speak Hebrew. That was the common language with Jesus and his men and his people. They spoke Hebrew. And evidently she had the ability to speak Hebrew as well. You can learn about anything. 
There are some here, no, no doubt, tonight that can speak. If not fluently, you can speak other languages. I happen to be one of those. I speak fluent, dividing ridge. In Hampton in general. Phil does too. But it's not unusual to be able to learn and speak another language. And because of the close proximity where these Syrophoenician people lived, they were around Jews all the time. They would have picked it up. So she goes to the Lord not speaking in her native tongue, she speaks Hebrew. Why? Remember what I said a moment ago? This person is trying to deceive Jesus. Another thing was, in all probability, living so close to all these Jewish people. She probably resembled a Jewish woman. They lived in the same climate. There would not have been a big difference in the color of their skin. She probably dressed like a lot of the Jewish women. But when she went to Jesus, she majored on every one of those points. She's speaking Hebrew. She has attired herself in what would have been a normal outfit for a Jewish woman. And she's hoping, you've heard the old saying, to pull one over. She's hoping to pull one over on Jesus. I read that and I kind of thought, isn't that hilarious? To try to pull one over on Jesus. And then it, I kind of got real convicted about it because there's been times that we've done the same thing. We do something we know we should not do. It was wrong. And we kind of feel somehow, well, I, Jesus probably didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he saw it. No doubt. She spoke in her conversation in a way that she thought a Jewish woman would speak to another Jew. And she cries out, Oh Lord, Son of David. She's acknowledging Him. And that's important. We'll get to that in a moment. She's acknowledging Him for truly who He is. Oh Lord, Son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But Jesus didn't answer her. Why? I believe it was because He perceived He's God. He perceived what she was trying to do. So that's our Lord's perception. Second, there's His patience. Look at verse 23. And His disciples came and urged Him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. And He, Christ, answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now here is a portion of verse and a verse that can easily be misunderstood. 
And it would be real, real easy to read this passage I just read and not really have a positive view of Jesus. I've done a lot of reading on this verse and most of the commentaries I read after indicate that in all probability at this point because the disciples said send her away. Most commentators agree that the disciples were probably saying to Jesus heal the daughter. And do for her what she wants. They knew he had the power. Now there's no evidence whatsoever that this young daughter was there. In fact, I think in all probability she was not there. I think she was at home. Probably someone watching after her. Again, this didn't happen continually. It just happened at certain times. So the disciples who are really frustrated. You know why? As far as they're concerned, she's making a scene. They're out in public. And she's begging and wailing and saying, Oh, Lord, Son of David, heal my daughter. And she doesn't stop. She continues to say this over and over and over. And the disciples have had enough. They may have felt, get this, they may have felt at this point, this, this doesn't look good on our ministry. You've, you've got a reputation, Jesus. Heal this daughter. Send this woman away. I think in reality they're hoping that she'll leave. Now the words Jesus uttered, and that's why I said a moment ago, this could easily be misunderstood. The words that Jesus uttered almost seemed like a contradiction. It wasn't that what he had preached on other occasions, really. It was different. Before this ever happened, there had been instances where he had made statements about there is neither Jew or Gentile. People are people. And all people, whether they be Jew or whether they be Gentile, now that will be enlarged on more as we move in to particularly the Pauline epistles. But Jesus was saying what would later be expounded on, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. All people need the Savior. And I have come to be the Savior of all people. Yet, what He said, again, almost seems like a contradiction. He said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you take that right on face value, you could come away from saying that, well, evidently Jesus was a racist too. He must have been a bigot himself. I've not been sent by my father except to the house of Israel. Yet before, previously, he had reached out to Gentile people. How do we, how do we bring those two what seem to, to be opposing viewpoints 
together. I said a moment ago, we see Jesus' perception, but we also see His patience. And that's what He's doing. He is exercising patience. You see, there is a message that needs to be sent out. By the way, that message would resound all through the ministry of Jesus. I've came to my own. They get the gospel delivered to them first. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So was God being prejudiced? No. No. In my opinion, the heart of God was to send the gospel to His people, Israel, to save them and to empower them to ignite within them the blessed gospel and to reach out to not only other Jews, but to Gentiles. Now, we see that completely happen as we move into the book of Acts. It becomes clear. Simon Peter, a Jew, struggled with it. The Lord had to straighten him out. Even the Apostle Paul, initially, another Jew, struggled with that. But God straightened him out. And they both went on to be great soul winners and evangelists for all people, whether they be Jew or Gentile. I think that the Lord is working patiently on two levels. I think He's working on this mother. But I think He's also working on His disciples. Both. So we've seen His perception. His discernment, His awareness. This woman could not pull anything over on Him. He's God. We've seen His patience. We close with His power. I like a story that has a good ending to it, don't you? Look in verse 25. <clears throat> then she came and worshipped Him. Now remember, He had just told her that my ministry is to the house of Israel. He had just said that. Then she came and worshipped Him. By the way, that's always a good way to get on Jesus' side. She came and worshipped Him saying, Lord, help me. Do you sense... Do you sense the heart of this mother? Lord, help me. Now she's coming in behalf of her daughter. But I think she's acknowledging here what her daughter is going through. She's going through also. Maybe even more. Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, there's another place that people read this verse and say, Oh my goodness, he's calling this woman a dog? Now, a little bit of an explanation. And it probably still happens today, those of you who have inside pets. 
Inside pets are notorious. If you're eating, they expect to eat as well. Right? It's share. Our daughter and son-in-law have a pretty little Yorkie you ever saw in your life. But if they're eating, she's supposed to eat. Brother Kyle can tell you the same thing. So it was customary, probably still happens today, it was customary if you were around the table and you were eating and a morsel fell in the floor, you just let the dog eat it. Now those who were real sensitive, who loved their little pet so much, Every chance they got, they would break off a piece and drop it down in the floor. And Jesus had just told this woman, it's not good to take the children's bread. And when he says that, he's talking about Israel's understanding of the gospel. He says it's not good. And he was not being ugly when, when he called, referred to the Gentiles as being little dogs. He's not talking about a mongrel. He's talking about, he's probably talking about a Yorkie. I love the reply of this woman. It is fabulous. What does she say after that? And she said, verse 27, Yes, Lord. She agrees. Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. The little dog has got to eat also. Look, we're talking about Jesus' power. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. What you come looking for, what you wanted me to do, you got it. It's great. Now again, I don't think she was there. Didn't matter. No problem for the Lord. They said in the first time that He healed someone or did something miraculous and they weren't even there. I said a moment ago, in all probability, the daughter was at home being cared for by someone else. Latter part of the verse, and the daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, let me give you my thoughts on this. The mother turns, she goes home. There's the daughter. There's ever who's caring for the daughter. When she goes into the house, the one who was caring for the daughter, she could have been having one of these demonic attacks. I don't know. But something happened that was so evident to that caregiver that that loved one was healed. And get this, and I believe that's what the verse is saying. I believe they begin to look back. It took her a certain amount of time. She knew about what the time was that Jesus had said that. And when she got home, she talked to the caregiver and they said, it was exactly at that time. 
That's when it happened. So in the end, this woman got exactly what she was hoping for. Jesus cast that demon simply by speaking the word from her daughter. I believe verse 27 is the key statement. She showed extraordinary faith and great wisdom. How do you come up with that off of the top of your head? You've just been told it's not good to give the meat, the food, the gospel to little dogs. And the wisdom that she had plus the love that she had for her little girl said, yes, I agree. But even the little dogs need food. She was healed. So Jesus gave her what she was desiring and at the same time issued a great point. It's the will of the Father to preach the glorious good news. That's why I was sent to my people. As I said a moment ago, we ignite them, we excite them. After they are saved, they go out and they evangelize the world. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. But, here's the good thing. God always has all the bases covered. Even though the Jews did not do it. The Gentiles did. That's why we're here. This evening. At some point in our life. Probably in every one of our case. Some Gentile preacher. Open the Word of God and share it. And we received it. And we were saved. Deceit is not a good thing. Not a good thing. But to me, this story, it has an incredible storyline, but it has a tremendous ending the woman got what she wanted all right i hope uh, again this is not an oft used text and if you've ever read that and struggle with it a little bit i hope that god illuminated some things have a great rest of the week let's stand